first of all, uh, it seems to me the, the theme of, the, of this day of the conference could be characterized uh, under the question, uh, to what extent have the issues surrounding Darwin changed or stayed the same uh, since his day? Uh, that was a particular theme of um, Michael's uh, paper. Um, and um, his point of view was that the continuities between Darwin's original theory uh, are still there, but today's um, uh, biological activities, uh, research methods, have uh, changed considerably. And uh, this was particularly interesting to me because I've always wondered why it's the case that given how many of the ideas Darwin used were already in the air at the time he wrote, and given how much has been added to and developed since his day, it's still the case that Darwinism and evolutionary biology are almost uh, treated as synonymous. And your suggestion that he was the uh, catalyst for a paradigm change and produced what uh, Kuhn would call the formative text for the paradigm uh, uh, puts that all in perfect perspective, so thank you. David's paper highlighted the similarities between Victorian conflicts and conflicts that are still going on today. And uh, the particular issue that he brought up was the role of the um, belief in a soul uh, in uh, both of these eras. And I'm gonna say more about that uh, uh, in my own remarks. Ron's focus was on the development and spread of creationism and what a recent innovation that is. Um, and that's going to be very valuable for people who teach about evolution. Uh, here's a parallel case. Uh, a lot of students uh, who come to my institution have been taught inerrancy as a proper interpretation strategy for the Bible. And they think that they are the ones who are holding on to the faith of their fathers and mothers going all the way back. And it, it uh, consoles them quite a lot to find out that the doctrine of inerrancy is essentially a 20th century invention. And uh, so for the creationists uh, who come to Fuller, uh, it'll be very useful for me to be able to say, uh, well, creationism was actually a 20th century invention also. Uh, there are a couple of issues that I would like to raise um, uh, uh, in order to add to the material of the conference. Uh, David helpfully noted the role of body-soul dualism uh, in the evolutionary debate. And um, I've done a lot of lecturing on the nature of the human person over the last 15 years. One of the things that I have been dis uh, surprised to find out, and I find this out by making my audience uh, raise their hands in answer to a multiple choice question, I ask them, how many parts uh, are human beings made of? One part, a physical body, two parts, a body and soul or body and mind, or three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And I have been really amazed to find out that the dualist and uh, tripart uh, understandings of human nature by far are the most common in um, lay audiences. And uh, often these are theology and science conferences, and so I expect there to be a lot of scientifically educated people there and in one case, I was speaking to about 2,000 folks in uh, Portland, and there was only one physicalist in the room of 2,000. Um, my colleague, Warren Brown, um, pointed out about 15 years ago that with all of the new in information coming out about neuroscience, given the, the predominance of dualism and tripartiteism in the culture, this was likely to lead to a sort of conflict as virulent as the evolution uh, Christianity con conflict has been. And so he suggested that we try to get a book out uh, in advance of the development of the battle lines that would not argue against dualism, but would show that uh, physicalism is an equally acceptable position for Christians. And we did that, and it's led to a huge amount of lecture opportunities for Warren and me and others. But what surprised me about it is how ironic the uh, encounters have been. Um, I've never, never been attacked for my views. I've always been listened to quite uh, politely, 
disagreed with uh, politely. And so uh, when, um, mm, I'm terrible with names. Um, oh, Dyron uh, uh, commented in his response uh, about the importance of dialogue. Uh, one of the points of dialogue that we can have between Christians and scientists right now is the question of dualism versus physicalism as an account of human nature. And of course that opens the door to the evolution debate because if you um, uh, understand yourself physicalistically, then it's much easier to understand yourself as in continuity with the rest of the animals. So I see this as a very hopeful uh, sort of development in um, uh, contemporary culture. The second issue that's always in the elephant in the room when um, the Christian versus evolution debate comes up is the problem of divine action. Uh, after Laplace, we came to have a worldview that was causally closed and deterministic. Well, that created a problem. Uh, how does God act in such a world? Um, and there were really only two options. Uh, one is to say that God works through natural processes uh, only, and that this is a nobler view of God than, than one who has to constantly tinker with it. And this is the strategy that liberal theologians took. The other one is to say that uh, if God created the laws of nature, then God is perfectly capable of violating them in order to perform special divine actions. And I've always been puzzled, not growing up Protestant, what accounts for the sharp split rather than a continuum between the liberals and the conservatives. And I've come to believe that it, it is in fact this issue of divine action because that affects how you understand revelation, that affects how you understand everything else in, in the church. So um, Charles Taylor in his book, A Secular Age, calls uh, what I would call the liberal eminentist view uh, providential deism. And um, he, uh, this is a position that developed first in order to account for the Newtonian determination of the universe, showed up next in economics, and then the final uh, place it shows up is in evolutionary biology. And so uh, the question that was asked this morning about what's the appeal of um, the uh, creationist accounts that draws so many people. And one part of the appeal might be um, an unvocalized but nonetheless correct perception that accepting biological evolution without interruption, such as the ID movement postulates, uh, is in fact just the one, one further step in the acceptance of providential deism. And uh, if Charles Taylor is correct, this has been one of the major factors in changing the West from uh, 1500, where it was Im almost impossible not to believe in God, to 2000, where many people find it, in fact, uh, impossible to believe in God. A related issue regarding the um, uh, intellectual influences in Darwin's life. An important um, uh, aspect to be included would be theology. Uh, in response to Malthus, already before Darwin wrote, for instance, there was Anglican clergyman Thomas Chalmers um, who argued that the struggle to survive is what calls for exertion and exertion is what produces mind. Therefore, um, uh, he produced a justification for allowing the children of the poor to starve and he argued that this is providential. It's providential uh, to, due to the, uh, it's providential to have a competitive world because that's what drives human, I, I can't say human evolution, but that's what drives human progress. Now, um, one other issue is I was struck by the individualism of the debates about whether uh, human morality and rationality could have evolved along with our physical bodies. Um, there was no mention made of culture. 
And that's not really surprising back in the early modern period because individualism was just so thoroughly accepted. But um, it's an important ingredient for us to think about now. Uh, Thomas, um, Andy Clark uh, produces, uh, wrote a book in which he argues that uh, almost all of human uh, intellectual development is a product of what he calls mental scaffolding. That is, uh, humans have been able to, to produce technology, such as writing, uh, books to store knowledge and transmit it to future generations, and so on and so forth. And so what the debate about the evolvability of culture is leaving out is the extent to which uh, or the evolvability of morality is leaving out is the extent to which morality is a product of culture. And of course, those who object that um, morality could not have evolved uh, are failing to, to um, um, recognize the extent that they are presumably believing that their own culture is heavily influenced by uh, revelation from God. Now, just to end on a lighter note, um, I got an interesting question from a student just yesterday. Uh, since we humans did evolve with our um, superior mental abilities, would it be possible for some other line of animals to evolve comparable uh, intellectual capacities? And so, for instance, is it possible that dolphins are already as intelligent as we are, but they just can't, don't have any way to communicate with us? And I said, what, and this goes back to the issue of, of um, uh, scaffolding. Uh, since they don't have hands, uh, they can't build computers. And since they have to stay in the water, the computers wouldn't work anyway. So no hope for the dolphins, sorry to say. And then I propose that um, the next uh, species that's going to join us at this level of uh, intellectual development is definitely going to be the raccoons because they've got the same degree of manual de dexterity that we've got. Thank you.